Blockchain technology will revolutionize the way we transact and do business. Its financial and social implications are far-reaching and inclusive. And today, I'm going to focus on how blockchain can help reduce barriers and increase opportunities for all, which is important to me because I grew up surrounded by barriers. My story begins in the third grade. I had recently moved from Los Angeles, perhaps the world's my most diverse city, to Hiram, Utah. <laughs> At the time, it was a one-stop sign farming town where I was pretty much the entire diversity for the whole county. Not to mention, we were the poorest of poor on welfare, sometimes unsure if we'd have something substantive to eat. And as a girl, I was often reminded that education was for boys, especially in my family because nobody pursued a college degree. And I so desperately wanted to go away to an amazing college, but I couldn't afford the $35 college application fee. I had encountered barrier after barrier. I was part of that unsharing, uneducated, and opportunity economy. Eventually, I did receive a scholarship, and since then, I've traveled and worked all around the world, from Africa to Asia, Central America, and Europe. And each time, I, of course, loved meeting new cultures, but I realized how blessed I am to be an American. Because so many of our global brothers and sisters, they don't have access to education or to simple financial services like a bank or to protect fair labor practices or even an opportunity to vote. Then I landed this amazing job for a global financial powerhouse, the country's largest purchaser of mortgage-backed securities. It was a too-big-to-fail institution. And I wined and dined clients, I attended black tie events, I was on top of the world. But knowing how the other half lived, I always felt conflicted about power being centralized within these too few institutions. After all, Centralization was just another type of barrier for people like me. Not to mention, I was also surprised about the data that was transferred between these institutions because they were very often outdated, incomplete, and just lacked transparency, which seemed seriously problematic for something like mortgage-backed securities. And then came 2008, the crash. My concerns about transparency and centralization were actually deeply embedded in our financial framework. We saw 10 million families lose their jobs, savings, and homes, while the richest 1% became richer and the middle class shrank to its small size. Our entire financial service system was on the brink of extinction and termination. And we, we had to bail out these large institutions in which we placed our trust to be custodians of our assets. These middlemen, they so painfully failed us. That same year, and perhaps not coincidentally, a person or persons under the name Satoshi Nakamoto issued a paper, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And it described how a version of digital money could be transferred from one person to another without the need of a middleman like a bank. So, if we don't need banks to transfer or store our digital money, then what does this mean for our entire financial system, the system that just failed us? And what does this mean for other types of middlemen? Well, Bitcoin. And yes, it is a digital currency, but it was the first blockchain protocol. And blockchain helps reduce the need for middlemen. It decentralizes power, and it makes tr tra uh, transactions transparent. So why do we need middlemen to begin with? Well, in our digital online universe, if I were to email you a dollar, maybe I'm buying something from you, and I don't use a middleman like a bank or Venmo or e-commerce site like Amazon, how would you trust that my dollar is really a dollar? And how would I trust that you receive my money and that you're going to send me that product? You can't. Not without a middleman like Venmo or Amazon that actually validates I am who I say I am, my digital dollar is really a dollar, the vendor's who they say they are, the product was, it cost this much, it was shipped on this date and delivered on this date, and so forth. So we have needed these middlemen to ensure trust in our digital transactions.
And they do this by validating each one of those transactions and then recording it on a ledger. The problem is now there are these layers of middlemen needed to validate these transactions, each of them having their own ledger. At the bare minimum, there's my bank, the credit card processing company, the vendor's bank, and Amazon, all adding to cost and time, and now this lack of transparency between all of these ledgers. And we know since 2008 how dangerous lack of transparency can be. Also, our data is actually listed on these ledgers and it is not secure because these middlemen are subject to making mistakes, losing our data, mm, uh, being hacked, misusing our data, and even monetizing on our data. We're all very familiar with those data breaches from Equifax, Anthem, to Facebook. This is where blockchain comes in. It turns upside down that whole centralized ledger and instead hundreds of thousands of computer processors around the world, we call them miners, have a copy of this ledger. And instead of a centralized institution, these miners are now responsible for validating and managing that ledger. So blockchain is still a new technology and it's, many are being developed and tested all the time. Um, but for now, I'm gonna walk you through the original blockchain flowchart so you get a better understanding of how blockchain works and how it will be used in your future. All right, a transaction is being requested. That request then is broadcast to all of those network miners. Remember, there are hundreds of thousands of them around the world. And to validate that transaction, these miners compete to solve a mathematical problem. And whoever does so first is awarded Bitcoin. Well, that miner's math is double checked and uh, at least a majority of the miners must approve that transaction. Once the transaction is approved, the winner takes that approved transaction and combines it with other transactions and puts it on a block. The block is then chained to a prior block of approved transactions, and then every single miner's ledger is updated. After about three to four blocks, it's pretty, the data is pretty much irreversible. So because of this, we realize that a decentralized distributed ledger is actually more hack resistant than a centralized ledger because the data can't be lost or stolen since all of these miners have a copy of it. Also, they use that computational puzzle, which is known as cryptography. It's a secure type of computational language. And Changing the ledger, changing any transaction, actually disrupts the entire chain of transactions for all of those miners. So, what does all of this mean? Well, now we can trust code rather than an institution to manage our data. And because the need for middlemen is reduced, so are their fees and transacting digitally becomes affordable for all. Remember those global brothers and sisters without access to some financial service? Well, now we see the world's two billion unbanked and underbanked have the ability to digitally transfer and store money. Rather than it costing $35 to wire $100, blockchain reduces this to pennies. And in the very near future, because blockchain records on its ledger a product from its raw source to its placement on a shelf, we will better know and have more trusted information about the products and services we use. So we'll really know, is your olive oil truly made out of olives and is it really organic? Better yet, blockchain may be used to protect fair labor practices and improve quality of lives, ensuring that your engagement ring is indeed not a blood diamond, or that children were really not used in making that chocolate bar, or that the money you send to a refugee actually goes to help that refugee. And I hope that blockchain will be used to help protect and preserve democracy, guaranteeing that a voter's vote was actually accounted for. Since 2008, since Nakamoto's paper in 2008, Blockchain has made great strides from financial services to supply chain to voter registration, and we've only just begun because now we better understand the damaging effects of centralization and transparency. Centralization is serious, simply a barrier for us all. Perhaps if blockchain had existed in 2008, it might have helped prevent the Great Recession. Perhaps if it had existed when I was in the third grade, college applications might have been more affordable for all.
What is certain is that blockchain is an amazing technological tool providing for a more fair, inclusive sharing economy, democratizing access to knowledge and wealth, and reducing those barriers and increasing opportunities for all. Thank you.